Everybody, welcome to today's um, Kubernetes Clinic, GitOps Best Practices, and the Kubernetes guardrails you need. Today's featured presenters are Andy Suderman, who is the CTO of Fairwinds, and um, <laughs> sorry, Stevie Caldwell, who is the tech lead at Fairwinds. Apologies. Today's session is going to be in listen-only mode. As usual, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A tab in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We'll queue them up and answer them toward the end. Andy and Stevie, over to you. Thanks, Dave. Um, so yeah, good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, yeah, so uh, Andy and I are going to be uh, talking about GitOps best practices and the Kubernetes guardrails that you need. I'm going to do a, a quick intro about uh, what GitOps is and stuff, and then Andy is going to go into a demo. So um, uh, just a quick, you know, Revisiting of the introductions, as Dave said, I'm Stevie Caldwell, I'm the SRE technical lead here at Fairwinds. I've been here for about three years now, uh, and I have a uh, extensive history working in various areas of technology. I've been a sysadmin, I've been a network engineer, uh, DevOps person, all those all those things. As the roles have changed, so have I also changed. Uh, and Andy. I'm Andy. I'm the CTO here. I am also, uh, I like to refer to it as a reformed sysadmin. Um, been through all the different roles. I've been at Fairwinds for about four and a half years. I've been working with Kubernetes and Cloud Native for going on seven now. Um, so, um, and then uh, just happy to talk about all things open source all the time. So excited to talk about GitOps today. So uh, let me um, do a quick reading of the Fairwinds mission. Um, so Fairwinds is a trusted partner for Kubernetes security, policy, and governance. With Fairwinds, customers ship cloud-native applications faster, more cost-effectively, and with less risk. We provide a unified view between dev, sec, and ops, removing friction between those teams with software that simplifies complexity. There. Um, so uh, are we doing a... Yes, we're skipping right. All right, so... Uh, before I, we get started, Andy, I just had a quick question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Where would you go to see a band called 1,023 megabytes play? 1,023 megabytes? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Where would I go? Nowhere. They haven't had any gigs yet. <laughs> nice. <Yes. laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> oh. All right. So, yeah. Uh, so, opening topic here. What is GitOps? Let's, le uh, let's level set. Make sure everyone uh, understands exactly what it is we're talking about here today. Um, it's a buzzy word. Everyone's talking about it. You've, all the articles come out and stuff, and it's like this hot, this, this new hotness, except for it's really not that new. Um, it's actually a, a, a term that was coined back in 2017, um, actually by Weaveworks. Some of you may have heard of Weaveworks. They're a company that also has a lot of cool open source tooling. Uh, they've been in the space for a while. Uh, and they, on their website, actually have a, a pretty good anecdote about uh, how they came to term the coin, uh, term the coin, coin the term GitOps, um, related to uh, apparently there was an engineer that was going to push some change uh, and told everyone, hey, if uh, I'm going to push this change and if it goes poorly, I'm going to wipe everything out. So just be prepared for that. And uh, he pushed the change and indeed it did not go well and wiped everything out. But because they had everything in Git, they were apparently able to uh, restore their platform in about 45 minutes. And there's a lot of like detail I'm sure we're missing there about how that all came to be. But uh, you know, when they retro that and talked about you know how great it was that they were able to recover so quickly, that led them down the path of identifying the various things uh, that made that possible. And that's when they came up with this whole GitOps idea. And uh, you know. Um, and as such, like that's been ad adopted by the CNCF. There's a whole GitOps working group now um, that's uh, meant to sort of define what GitOps is and make it uh, vendor neutral. Uh, so the four main principles of GitOps in no particular order, because uh, you know what is order? Um, GitOps is declarative, um, which means that it, it focuses on fact and not instructions, right? Just like Kubernetes, you tell it what's supposed to be, not how to make it that way. Uh, GitOps uses Git as a source of truth, um, and uh, the Git source of truth is versioned and immutable, and that's one of the benefits of it. Um, 
uh, the GitOps focuses on automatic pull mechanisms, right? So in our a sort of standard flow is that you do all your, you know, builds and tests and things in your CI pipeline. And somewhere in there, you probably have some commands that like then push all the things to your cluster. Uh, the GitOps philosophy is that your cluster uh, should be pulling those changes itself, um, that you shouldn't be pushing to it. And then the last thing is that, um, you know, your cluster is continuously reconciled, that it uh, takes advantage of control loops to keep an eye on how things are supposed to be and to keep your cluster in that state, much like the internal guts of Kubernetes itself, which is all about controllers that are watching, uh, you know, the state of things versus the, the way that you want things to be. So um, that is sort of the, the thing behind the GitOps philosophy. And we at Fairwinds, uh, we use GitOps internally for our uh, internal infrastructure. Um, and we mainly use it for managing add-ons to our infra. So things like Cert Manager and Nginx Ingress and External DNS, things like that. Um, we use uh, GitOps to uh, install those things in our internal clusters. Um, and we do that via Argo CD, which is one of a few different um, GitOps tools out there. And it's uh, essentially like a, a thing that you deploy in your cluster. Uh, you could figure it to, you know, to watch a particular repo and, uh, and to then reconcile what's in that repo with a particular cluster or clusters. Uh, it's much like uh, Kubernetes in that there's a, you know, it's like a control loop. It's watching, 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 and then reconciling in cluster um, whatever the state is, uh, except for the state is in Git. Um, and so what we're going to do today, now that you have like sort of a basic background of what GitOps is and what Argo CD is, we're going to turn it over to Andy, uh, who has the magic hands of uh, our <laughs> of our organization. Uh, he actually set up um, I think all of the GitOps stuff for our uh, internal um, infrastructure. And so we're going to have him demonstrate really how all that works and what that looks like live. Awesome. Thanks, Stevie. It's a great intro. Great intro. So as Stevie said, we use Argo CD. Um, and we use Argo CD in kind of a very specific way um, that, uh, that we've developed in-house, not really developed, so adopted is a better word. I didn't create this pattern. Um, but uh, here we have, I'm just going to show kind of the setup here. We have a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this is an EKS cluster, doesn't really matter. Um, but I have access to it. It's got a few nodes in it. It's got some stuff in it. Some add-ons, like some of the ones that Stevie mentioned, Ingress, Ingress Ingress Nginx, we're all flipping words like around us. today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got our own in-house RBAC manager. We've got the VPA installed, a few different things. I'm not really going to worry about exactly what's running in the cluster right now. Um, and in this repository um, that's called FKS Infrastructure, um, we have a um, directory that has a whole lot of Kubernetes manifests in it. A lot of them uh, for all the different add-ons that are installed in this cluster. And we have Argo CD running in the cluster and it is connected to that manifest directory. So anytime we make a change, uh, as we'll show it here in a few minutes, each one, any one of these applications that gets changed, this will sync with the Git repository and then synchronize the state into the cluster. Fairly straightforward. Uh, Argo CD gives us this really nice dashboard, which I, I'm not a big dashboard person, but I've really enjoyed using this dashboard. I don't know why. Um, it's you know useful for debugging. You can get logs. You can see you know a diff that might be coming in. You can sync. There's all kinds of cool stuff going on here. Uh, we can see what applications might be out of sync. If we go to our full list, we can click out of sync. We don't have any of those right now. Uh, if something's failing, it'll show us that. Like if a pod's crash looping, it'll show it in a degraded state. Um, so lots of interesting things there. Um, but uh, you, you may be asking yourself, how do we manage all of the all of the YAML in this directory? There's probably I don't know. Uh, I think there's like 280 YAML files in this directory. Um, 
And obviously I don't want to manage those all myself. Typically I would be a big proponent of Helm. Uh, and so we actually have an in-house, not an in-house, an open source tool that we've built called Reckoner that allows us to declare a bunch of Helm charts in a single YAML file. So I've got this YAML file. It's got a list of releases in it. And each one of these releases is a Helm chart. So I've got the Ingress Nginx chart at a specific version. It comes from the Ingress Nginx repository. I've got all the values that I want to apply to that chart uh, right here in line. I can split that into a separate file if I want. Um, and then I can, uh, as of the latest versions of Reckoner, I can now specify some things related to Argo CD in this as well. So you may see this release, Ingress Nginx, has a GitOps section, Argo CD, um, and it's specifying a source path. And then if we actually go up into the top of this file at the global level, we have an Argo CD application um, manifest. And an application manifest specifies, well, one of these applications in Argo CD. So like if we're looking at the Ingress Nginx one right now, this is declared in my cluster as an application manifest. If we look in that directory, the manifest directory, we're going to see that uh, that application manifest right here. So this tells Argo CD that I have a repo and I've got this path and I want everything from this path to be applied in this namespace with these options. Uh, and so I've got an automated sync policy that tells it to automatically sync if there's changes and whatnot. In, and in so, your local server, right? Like that's that's another thing that's in that application manifest that tells you which server. Right, which, to. which cluster. Which cluster um, is, is, sorry, yeah, yeah. It, it's called server because that's like the API endpoint that it's hitting. This right. is the internal cluster API endpoint. But yeah, great, great call out. Because you can run Argo CD in a separate cluster and have it push out to other clusters, which seems kind of odd because one of the GitOps philosophy one of the GitOps principles is pull it's but pulling, yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't really played with Argo CD multi-cluster yet it's really mostly just in the single cluster controlling everything in that cluster um, so what we do is uh, we have a, a reckoner command where we can reckoner template the course.yaml uh, and if we just ran that normally uh, and we tell it to do all the releases what we would see is it spits out all the YAML for all the Helm charts that are defined in that course file. Um, now, obviously just spitting that out standard out, it's not super helpful, um, but we'll see it here in a second. It takes a second because it's got to go pull all the Helm charts, it's template them out, spit them all out. And there's probably, I think there's like nine or 10 Helm charts in here. So we can scroll back up and see that there's just all kinds of YAML here. And I could, if I really wanted to pipe that through something like kubectl slice, which is an add-on that'll take that giant thing and split it out into multiple YAML files. But instead we've made Reckoner do this for you. So I'm gonna give it the output directory uh, and I'm gonna tell it manifests. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna create this folder structure inside of the manifest directory uh, so one for each app. So Ingress Nginx, all the manifests for that are going to get dumped in there. And then because I put that GitOps section in there, it's actually going to generate that Argo CD application manifest and put it in the Argo CD apps directory. So then all I have to do is create what we're going to, what, we, what is called an app of apps that points back to that folder and syncs the applications. So this is the only thing I have to manage manually is this individual Argo CD application manifest that points to that list of application manifests, if that makes sense. So when we create a new application, it gets synced into Argo CD and then it starts syncing the things. So it's kind of a layered approach. That's very meta. Um. <laughs> it's very meta. I mean, there's also another app of apps that controls this app, but we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I have to ask an obvious question here. So. Uh, to sort of recap, what you're doing is you're using Reckoner, uh, the Fairwinds open source tool, uh, mm -hmm. to go through a course YAML that has a bunch of Helm charts listed in there. Mm -hmm. And then you're running like essentially like a, a, a Helm template and you're spitting yep. out the YAML using that the Helm would do. But Argo CD has the ability to actually just also use Helm charts. 
So why would you go through all those steps as opposed to just saying pointing to the Helm chart? That's a great question. That is a great question. So RSED definitely gives you the ability to just say, basically do exactly what Reckoner's doing and say, here's a Helm chart, install it, create a Helm release, all that good stuff. Um, and that works. It works fine. Where we start, where I start to have issues with that is when we start talking about Git workflow. So the whole point of GitOps is that my Git repository is the single source of truth for what's running in my cluster. And so all of you know these manifests are exactly, it's a declarative state of what should be applied to my cluster. And um, one of the benefits is that when I wanna make changes to that, I can see the change, right? And so uh, if we go over here, I have a, a PR open for this repository where I've updated external DNS. Now, if we were to use the Helm application type from Argo CD, our git diff when we made this change would just look like this. It would just be this single bit of information, which is the version of the chart that I'm installing and then any values that might have changed when I did that. But because it's a Helm chart, all of the, uh, all of, all of the changes that are actually occurring because of that are opaque to me. I can't see those in this git diff anymore. They're buried in the Helm chart that is going to get installed in the cluster. And so if I merge this and it got applied, I don't know what's going to get applied. I can't see that diff. Now, Argo CD does give you the ability to do that. Um, so if you're in Argo CD and you're using the Helm application type and you uh, go in here and there's like a, a new version, you can click this app diff and it will show you the application diff for that Helm chart in the full manifest templated out and everything. But I don't want to have to go into the Argo UI to see that. I want that in Git, which is my single source of truth. So by templating out these manifests, what we actually get is a full diff of the exact changes that are going to happen before they get into my cluster. So I see here the all the stuff that's going to happen in my cluster. So okay. I think that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. So it's cool. essentially just increased transparency, like mm -hmm. gives you all all the information you need versus selective information. Right. Yep. Okay. And it pushes puts everything into our source of truth, which is Git. It's yep. version. We can see all the changes. Um, Good stuff there. The other thing that it lets me do, which is kind of the next topic I want to talk about, is do um, static analysis on my YAML, basically, to run CICD checks mm -hmm. against this YAML um, in my CICD system. So if we go back to uh, this PR, we're going to see there's a bunch of checks that are running against this uh, pull request. Well, we've written one check that basically validates that this that the Reckoner template was executed correctly. Um, so it, it uh, basically does that Reckoner template command that I, I showed with the output directory and it um, and, and verifies that there's no Git changes, right? So that we didn't you know, go modify some YAML manually that's not tracked in the course YAML file, all that good stuff. Uh, we're also gonna run a cube conform check because while the Helm chart may you know, have spit out some YAML, that YAML hasn't actually been validated against the schema for Kubernetes yet because Helm doesn't do that on Helm template because it doesn't have access to a cluster necessarily. It doesn't have to. Well, kubeconform is this nice tool that um, will actually do that for me. And so it takes all of the manifests and it, um, it uh, validates them against the schema from the Kubernetes repository. So we can see here, I actually have a failing test that says my external DNS deployment is invalid. Uh, the security context.fs group should be an integer. It got a string. And that's also true for run as users. So actually, if we go back here and we look at our course.yaml, uh, and you may have seen this in the diff already as well, uh, in the external DNS chart, I added a security context somewhere. Um, oh, I got to check out my PR. All right. So we'll take a look at this. We'll go back down to external DNS. So I've added this pod security context trying to enhance my security, but I put these in as strings 
not as integers. And these need to be integers. So I'm going to change that in my course.yaml. I'm going to reckoner template course.yaml output directory manifest. I'm just going to tell it to do external DNS just for speed. Um, we could, you know, obviously run use dash a at any point and that'd be fine. Um, but at just targeting a single release will go a little bit faster. What that's going to do is it's going to go ahead and make that change. So this is the change in the course.yaml. And then we see here the exact change happening in the manifest directory on the external DNS deployment YAML. So I'm going to commit that, uh, fix schema. We're gonna push that up and hopefully this kubeconform check will start passing. The other thing kubeconform can do is it'll spit out a JUnit file, which means if you want to hook it up to CircleCI and have it show your tests, like each individual test, uh, it will do that, which is kind of cool. Um, so let's go back to our PR. So we're going to run two other checks against this. These are both Fairwinds open source checks. We've got Polaris and Insights. Polaris is going to check for lots of um, best practices for security, efficiency, and reliability. So we can come in here and see all the, um, all the different checks that may be failing in here. Um, you know, we see that uh, the Sentinel container has privilege escalation allowed. You can configure this with a config file. Um, lots of different stuff happening in here. It's failing because we found 31 danger items uh, across all of our 280 manifests. So, um, yeah, looks like we found 30 different controllers, so different pod controllers. And actually, it caught the uh, that. Uh, that issue with the, um, that the YAML as well. Yeah. yeah. So you have, uh, you said, so the, the push that you just put up was literally changing um, that data type in the FS group from a string to an integer. Yeah. And uh, you're showing, so it uh, actually failed like that, that check um, in Polaris for like a bunch of other stuff originally, like, it's showing all the failures for everything in that entire, uh, in, in that entire, you said all the manifests there and not just like the singular one. Right, not just the one that I modified, which is okay. a little bit of a downside of using, like you, I could write some bash to basically like check which files changed, run Polaris against just that file um, and just put out the, you know, the issues with that. Mm -hmm. You can also have Polaris modify the exit code based on score. So like if you have a baseline score for your repository, you could basically say, don't let it drop below that and maybe ratchet it up over time. There's a couple of different tactics you could do. You kind of have to customize that, you know, in your CI system. Mm -hmm. um, Fairwinds Insights lets you kind of do this automatically. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, okay something we can we can improve on with Fairwinds Insights. So, uh, but yeah, good call out. It's the whole repository, the whole set of manifests getting checked here. Cause like the Argo CD repo servers getting checked here. Well, we didn't modify the Argo CD repo right. server, we just modified external DNS. So why am I getting dinged for that? Yeah. Definitely a question. Okay. Um, same thing with Pluto actually. So we, we've run a Pluto check. Pluto checks for deprecated APIs, API versions in your cluster. Um, and so we're checking to make sure we're not trying to deploy anything that's been deprecated. Well, we see we've got some demo stuff. We've got the cluster autoscaler. We've got some Prometheus stuff in here that's all failing our um, Pluto check. But I, I don't want to go fix that. I'm trying to update external DNS, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely. Um, a question. So I think the next thing to show um, is what happens when we merge, because um, we've got our we've got our update here. It's passing cube conform. Yes, it's failing Pluto and Polaris, but it's not failing for reasons related to this pull request. So, you know, I'm going to make the you know executive decision to just ignore that, and um, we'll come in here and we'll give it a merge, and. Uh, we can now go back to our uh, Argo CD UI, take a look at external DNS. This will happen automatically on a, you know, 
schedule, but I just hit the refresh button. And so I refreshed um, the Git state and now it is syncing. So it's updating all of the different pieces of external DNS that changed there. Um, and over a few seconds, we'll start to see some things go green and look at that external DNS was updated. So I didn't have to do any sort of Helm to Helm apply. I didn't have to do anything. I just had to merge the pull request. This synchronized. The other thing is if I go in and like modify external DNS manually, like maybe I accidentally delete it. I want to just delete the deployment here. It's going to detect that very quickly, realizes the deployment's gone. And lo and behold, oh, let's see. It should auto sync, but I haven't actually uh, tested this. Well, maybe I have a setting wrong in my application manifest. So I need to. Uh, go fix that. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit the synchronize button and it puts it back. So obviously I have a setting incorrect in my RRCD application manifest that I need to fix to auto repair, um, right. but it should be auto repairing itself. Yeah. There are a few different uh, settings in the application manifest that tells uh, Argo how to deal with um, when you delete things within the, the cluster or when you change things in the cluster where there's auto healing. Mm. Um, gotcha. which doesn't look like that's must, in there. Must be missing a setting. Yeah. And then also like there's a prune setting, right? Where you can have Argo CD uh, actually remove things from the cluster. Yep. If you delete it uh, from your, from your YAML, like if you remove that YAML, decide you don't want that deployed anymore. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, stuff you could put in there. You can also determine specifically which branch, like you can go off specific branches and not necessarily, necessarily um, main or, or master or whatever. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, I was just wondering if we could find that spec real quick. Is it called auto heal? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that seems like a really, uh, it's interesting that that's not something that's very easy to find because. Right, I know. I, uh, here we go. Here's the application.yaml, the full one. Self-heal. Self-heal, that's it. All right, so if I add that, um, Let's make a couple more changes. So one other thing I'm going to do is uh, just kind of show the work, the full, oh, is it? Hang on. Sync policy automated self heal. Sync options, am I missing anything else here? Nope. Okay, so I'm gonna put that in the, the top level of my Argo CD application. I'm gonna add that here uh, in the in the course YAML file. And then um, I was gonna add a new one, but I think instead, um, let's actually, uh, I'm gonna update this basic demo chart, I think. See what the latest version is. It's 0.5.2. Um, all right. So now I'm going to do my Reckoner template again. And do all the charts um, because, in theory, we should be updating all of our application manifests. 
Um, so while I'm doing that, A, do we have any questions? No. no. Do you have any questions? Well, one thing that um, did occur to me when you're spitting out all this YAML uh, mm -hmm. into your into your repo to be managed by Argo, um, how are secrets kept secure? Oh, that's a good question. It's one of the big problems with GitOps is like, okay, I've got this declarative thing, but I can't put secrets in Git in plain text. Right. So how do we handle that? There's a couple different strategies that we've seen and one or two that we've used. Um, there's several different um, add-ons for Argo CD. So the one that we use is actually uh, Vault. Um, and so the Vault plugin lets you connect to a HashiCorp Vault instance and then write a secret manifest that has essentially a placeholder string in it that says, go get this secret out of Vault and put it right here. And so Argo CD will go get that out of Vault, deploy it into the cluster. It, um, it's kind of nice because it actually triggers a diff in Argo CD if it senses that the, if it detects that the upstream Vault secret has changed. So when you do that refresh, it actually checks Vault to see if the secrets change and will trigger a refresh if the secret changes. Um, so that's one, one way to do it. Um, another would be to use a different secrets manager in your cluster. So there's one called external secrets, which gives you a CRD that says, go get this secret out of wherever it could be our, it could be HashiCorp vault. It could be AWS secret store. It could be whatever Google calls theirs. I don't remember anymore. Um, and then drops a secret in the cluster from that that secret in your, you know, secrets manager. Mm -hmm. And so that would be just another, you know, um, YAML manifest in here that says, here's my, I don't remember what they call it. Do you remember the external secrets? It's like a, I think it's called an external secret. I think it's called, yeah. Yeah. So you'd create an external secret and that would generate your secret in the cluster. And then you reference that from your other YAML. So there's a few different tools out there that let you sort of declaratively say, go get a secret from here uh, mm -hmm. without declaratively putting your secrets in your Git, which is, I hope, something that you know, most of us aren't no, doing. Not doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm just gonna check my diff locally real quick here. I've got my self heal true. Uh, I updated the chart version and um, looks like we might have a bug in um, our, yeah, in our, um, get ops functionality here. Hmm. Assuming I put this in the right place. Uh, I'll have to go check that. That may be just a bug. This is brand new functionality. This is one of the first times I've actually used it. Um, uh, we've done other techniques to get the manifest out before. So, all right, I'm going to commit those changes. Um, update basic demo chart, add self heal, which probably isn't going to work, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. I'm going to make a pull request. Hmm. I don't know what happened there. All right, I'm going to take a look at our pull request that now has the wrong title. Take a look at our diff here. It should be what we expect, other than not adding self heal to the uh, to the things. The application manifest. Yeah. So one of the things that I want to call out, we fixed this API version here. So the new version of the demo chart has the networking.case.io slash v1 um, version. Uh, so hopefully we'll see Pluto um, fixing something here. So if we go take a look at our Pluto report. Hopefully we're we've got one less. Pluto finding, if you remember from earlier, 
uh, across all of our stuff. But now I think it's an interesting time. You know, we, we passed our keep conform check. We passed the record check. Obviously, we still have some Polaris stuff like we talked about. But this is the this is where I want to talk about Throwing's Insights because Insights really makes this a little bit nicer. Um, first of all, I have no configuration in my Circle CI for Insights. It's connected via GitHub app. Um, and it's auto scanning these pull requests once I add the repository to Fairwinds Insights. So we're going to see here, um, I've fixed an action item. We've fixed that this uh, networking API has been removed, which is great. Um, you know, good to know. Good to, to know that I've, you know, only affected this. If I had introduced additional bugs, it would show, you know, my failing checks here that are related to my PR. But the important thing is that it's related to the code that I changed here. Um, and so we can actually go take a look at Fairwinds Insights here and see the full repository report. So if we do want to see all that other information, all the things that were found in that in this you know, manifest directory that are an issue, we can look here. And you'll see we have multiple reports here. We've got a Trivi report, we've got a Polaris report, we've got a Pluto report, we've got an OPA report. Uh, OPA is kind of cool. It lets you write your own policies um, via Rego. Um, that apply to your YAML. So if you've got, you know, business logic or company specific things, like everything has to be labeled with a team or everything has to be annotated a certain way or whatever, we can add that into our checks and it's all managed here in one place and lets you, um, you know, hook that into your CI CD really quickly. Uh, we'll see here all the branches on our repository. And then when we select a specific branch, like the one we were just talking about, we'll see the changes relative to the master branch. I don't know what just happened there, but um, much more convenient than, you know, managing this, I, I didn't actually show it, but this, you know, fairly large, not massive uh, Circle CI file where we're downloading new versions of the tools, running the tool, outputting it the way we want to output it, all that stuff. So definitely I think, uh, a big step up from writing your own CI. Um, and then obviously, because it's done via GitHub integration, if we go to the repositories, we're gonna see all of our repositories across our, our, um, our uh, organization if we want. And it, it's connected via GitHub app. And so we just say, um, uh -oh. just a second, <laughs> gotta get my security key out. Um, we just say, all right, here's the repos it has access to, or give it access to all the repos. So I'll, uh, give it that one. Oh, that wasn't the right one, but that's okay. It's not going to hurt anything. We go back to Fairwinds Insights and then it gives us the option to turn on auto scan. And so you'll automatically start seeing those reports pop up. Um, and then you may have noticed too, I can create a ticket, um, based on these findings. So if like I'm and you know looking through these and I'm like, oh, this really needs to get fixed. I can create a ticket in that particular, well, that, that repository doesn't actually support tickets, but um, you know, if it did, I could create a ticket for that repository, um, give, give it some labels, some GitHub labels, and then just from here, automatically create a ticket for the team that needs to fix it. Um, we also have uh, a Jira integration to create those tickets as well. So lots of functionality on top of all this wonderful open source, bringing it all together in one place, making it much, much easier to use. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine it's much easier, like keeping track of uh, the different versions of open source tools within like a config.yaml, making sure to go in and update it when you need to. And just the, you know, the idea of like downloading all those files and having to put in like manual checks for checksums and things like that to make sure that you're downloading authentic, you know, valid uh, stuff is like a, a big pain. So being able to have something that just packages all that for you and it's a one place that you just connect up to your repo uh, seems like a real, a real uh, time saver. For sure, for sure. So, so, all right. Did I cover everything? I think so. I think one thing that I, I did want to um, go back to real quick. So you know, you were uh, showing after you tried to add something, I think, to the course.yaml um, and it didn't actually reflect in the YAML itself because there's, you know, something going on with it. How do you, um, how do you make sure that the course file 
if you're doing this method of like running record against the course file to spit out the YAML, how do you make sure that the course file and the manifest are in sync? Great question. Great question. We do that with a circle CI check. So we go back to our circle CI config. We'll actually see here, uh, we have a Reckoner check. We're gonna install Reckoner, we're gonna install Helm. And then we're gonna go ahead and go into that resources directory, run the Reckoner template command that I've been running. And then we're gonna check for a git diff. So if there's any diff after running that Reckoner template command, we're gonna fail our CI checks. So we make that a hard gating um, you know, check. Don't, let, don't allow merging if that's the case. And we keep you know, that from happening. That's good. Cool. Um, any other gotchas that we should be aware of in terms of using uh, GitOps and Argo CD? I think you know one of the things that um, comes to mind for me is stuff like um, you know does Argo CD play nicely with things like HPAs, right? So like if you um, have something in your cluster, if you have an HPA, it's obviously changing things like your replica account. Right. Um, so does Argo CD see like a replica count in your repo and see a difference? And then does it fight the HPA? Yeah. I mean, that would be a problem, but that's actually a big problem with using HPAs. You should mm -hmm. never set your replica count on your deployment while you're using an HPA, because every time you redeploy that deployment, you're going to reset that replica count until the HPA picks it back up. So that is a potential gotcha with Argo CD, Argo CD, but that's a problem in general, but definitely there's other issues where like you have a, an application that sort of modifies state in the cluster uh, dynamically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get into that weird sync loop, like you were just talking about where Argo CD is trying to change something and then it changes it and they're fighting each other. Uh, luckily, Argo CD gives us the ability to, to fix that. So there's actually an example in here. Um, if we look at the, the Prometheus chart, uh, it does this fun thing. Um, it's a little bit of a hack to basically make it so that you can deploy the chart the first time because it has a validating admission webhook in it, um, a, a validating admission, validating webhook configuration in it um, that validates that, you know, all the different um, CRDs associated with the Prometheus chart um, get, or the Prometheus operator are correct. Um, it's like a validation for that. Well, if you install that validating admission webhook configuration before the the server that serves that webhook comes up, then it will fail until that server comes up. And so you can't deploy anything else. So it causes problems on the first time you install the chart where it can't apply the chart. And so there is a there's a setting in validating webhook configurations to it's called failure policy. And that says to ignore failures or to fail on failures, um, basically. And so the chart for Prometheus has the YAML that sets that to, um, to ignore. So if we look at the validating webhook configuration and the failure policy here, it's set to ignore in the YAML. Well, when, then when the Prometheus operator comes back up, it actually goes and modifies that and turns it, turns it to fail. Uh, in order to provide better validation of your objects. Well, because it's declared as ignore here in the YAML, Argo CD is going to do exactly what you were saying. It's going to see that it changed. It's going to try to change it back, especially once we have self-heal turned on. Um, and so uh, Argo, Argo CD gives us the ability to ignore that. Um, and so what, what you can add to your application manifest is this ignore differences section. So we add an ignore differences under the Argo CD spec um, that says, you know, all validating webhook configurations ignore the webhooks zero failure policy field. And that means if we go into our, uh, into our UI here and we go look at Prometheus, we'll see that there's no diff here. Um, but if we look at the validating webhook configuration as it exists in the cluster, and we look for failure policy, we're gonna see that it's set to fail, even though our YAML says ignore. And so Argo CD is ignoring the ignore. <laughs> uh, so yeah, cool. definitely, you know, different caveats, things to work with when you're using GitOps. Um, I think Argo CD, I'm sure Flux has similar capabilities, but Argo CD does a good job of uh, giving you the tools you need 
to uh, handle those, you know, edge cases, specific scenarios and things like that. Cool. Yeah, it All seems right. like it's uh, in general pretty easy to get started with, but you know, as with anything, right? Like using it straight out of the box in production is probably not uh, not recommended, not your best bet. But uh, with you know a little tweaking, um, it certainly does get up to speed and and is uh, super helpful. So yeah. nice, I like Definitely. it. And cool. that UI is slick. All right. Well, we already talked about Fairwinds Insights. Uh, it does more than just CI/CD. We didn't talk about this today because it wasn't pertinent to our webinar. But uh, you know, it covers areas around security, cost optimization, and policy and guardrails, not just in your CI/CD, but in your live clusters. It offers admission control. Um, we're adding mutating admission control to it, um, and then a ton of cost optimization features for you to uh, sort of rein in the costs on your clusters. Uh, as well as a ton of security use cases. So uh, we obviously can't go over everything that Fairwinds Insights can do today because it's quite the platform, but I uh, just wanted to mention that. And then lastly, we have a white paper out there for you all. Uh, I think it will be emailed out to you uh, along with the recording link at the end of the webinar. Uh, so if you wanna check out a Kubernetes best practices white paper that we've put together, uh, that is available for free. So thank you so much for attending. Yeah. Everybody enjoy the rest of your day, week, month, year. <laughs>